book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 4 this morning. While you're turning there, uh, one, uh, one announcement, if you have an interest in a summer ministry up in uh, northeastern Wisconsin, uh, we do have a few spots left this summer at Northland Camp and Conference Center. And so after this morning's chapel or sometime during this week, come and see me. I do have some applications I can give you that would need to be filled out, and then we'll just have a brief interview. We hire actually 192 summer staff workers to come and work for us, and so we would be thrilled if we could have some folks from Clearwater Christian College. Do you ever stop to think how protective we are of the things that are important to us? At night, we lock our doors of our house, not only to protect the home, but to protect our family. We lock the doors of our car. We actually have an alarm system built in our car. Why? Because it's important to us. Since uh, September 11, 2001, we've established a homeland security to protect the borders of our own country. Why? Because human nature always protects that which is important to it. In Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, the Bible says that if we are going to protect anything, if we are going to stand guard, if we are going to put out money and effort and time to guard that which is important to us, the Bible says that we should guard above all things our own heart and our own thoughts. Notice what he says in Proverbs 4 and verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence. That is, above all guarding, guard your heart. Why? Because out of it are the issues of life. In other words, everything that you do on the outside is motivated by what you're thinking on the inside. As a man thinketh in his heart, the Bible says, so what? Is he? You are what you think about. So therefore, if you're going to guard anything, if you're going to be protective of anything, it should be your own thought life. Now, do you ever stop to consider what actually is going on in your thoughts? Years ago, I read an article by a gentleman who said the mind is made up of five different aspects. The first aspect of your mind is your ability to remember the past. We call that your memory. The second is your ability to think things through. That's your ability to reason. Have you ever had any time in your life where your parents looked at you and said, Were you thinking? The third aspect of your mind is your ability to learn, to understand, to take in facts. We call that knowledge. While you're here in college, you are receiving knowledge, but you're also learning how to reason. And when you take a test, you have to remember the things that you study. Then the fourth is your conscience. That's the ability to make right moral choices. For the conscience is, like Pinocchio found out, the Jiminy Cricket of the soul. And it will either commend you or it will condemn you for your actions. And then the fifth aspect of your mind is your imagination. That is the ability to think, to visualize, to conceive in your mind things that you want to do. And this morning I want to speak on the protection of your imagination. Because the Bible says that we should guard our heart, we should guard our thoughts. And the scripture says that we should guard the images that we allow to come in the forefront of our mind. So let's begin, first of all, with understanding the power of your imagination. For if we should protect it, it must be important and must be powerful. Now, when you look at the word imagination in both the Old and New Testament, it's very interesting. In the Old Testament, the concept of the word has the idea of forming pots out of clay, shaping and molding. So when the potter sits down at his wheel, he takes the clay, and it's a lump of clay, but in his mind he has an image of what he wants to make, and so he forms it, he shakes it, and, and shapes it. In the New Testament, the idea of the word uh, imagination has the ability to design, to think through, to deliberate, to make a plan, that's the concept of it. And there are two important aspects about the power of the imagination. Number one, the imagination is the ability to create reality. We call it dreams. 
Do you ever stop thinking that everything that you see started in somebody's imagination? The car you drive? The buildings that we are in are made by architects? When an army needs to create new weapons, it goes to the drawing board and there are engineers and architects and planners who sit down and think through and dream up and they conceive in their mind. Everything you see begins in the imagination. For the mind has the ability to conceive an idea, to believe what it is created in its mind, and then to strive to seek to achieve it. And so when you think of the imagination, it is very powerful because it has the ability to create reality. If a guy wants to get married, he has to at least imagine it. He looks at the girl and says, there she is, the dream of my life. And before long, they're standing at the wedding altar. And he had to somehow conceive in his mind how he's going to get that girl. That's the power of our imagination. But let me also say that the imagination not only has the ability to create reality, but it is through the imagination that we fuel our desires. For dreams motivate. They stir up our passions. They motivate our desires. If I meet somebody who's not motivated, I realize it's not that they're an unmotivated person. It's just that their imagination has not been captured. For all of, us, all of us by nature are motivated in some way or in some fashion. And the problem is that there's nothing that has captured your imagination. What does a politician want to do when he's striving for office? What does he do? He presents a dream, a reality, a hope, so that people would be motivated to vote for him. What does a coach have to do at halftime when the team is down by 10 points? And he wants to motivate them. He gives them a speech, a challenge, an illustration that fuels their desires. When I meet young people who are not motivated to live for Jesus Christ, in my mind there is something wrong in their imagination. There is something wrong in their dreams and their desires because when I was captured by Jesus Christ at the age of 19 years old and came into this wonderful relationship with Him, it was almost as if it was too good to be true. Heaven was my home. My sins were forgiven. I had the Holy Spirit living in my body. God had a purpose and a plan for my life. I could lay up for myself treasures in heaven. And all of these thoughts fueled my desires to be motivated to live for God. And so, the imagination is a very powerful aspect of our mind. Let me hasten to also say something about our imagination this morning, and that is, not only is it powerful... But because it is powerful, it can become a tool of Satan. And the second thing I want you to see about the imagination this morning is that the imagination, your imagination, can be perverted. In fact, it can be very corrupted. Do you realize that man's imagination is actually, by nature, perverted? The Bible tells us that when Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden, there was no corruption in their mind until they sinned. And when they sinned, there was something that took place in the heart of Adam that not only changed him, but changed all of mankind. And that is, there was a change in his nature. So that no longer was he motivated to live for God's glory, but he was motivated to live for himself. I want you to take your Bibles and turn, if you will, to Genesis chapter 5. And I want you to know what happened to the posterity of Adam. For he passed on this self-centered reality. Verse 1 of chapter 5 of Genesis, this is the book of the generations, the family of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness, in the image of God, made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam, in the day when they were created. And Adam lived 130 years, and begot, watch this, a son in his own likeness, after his image, and called his name Seth. Adam was created in the image of God. 
where his desires and his thoughts and his imagination and his purposes were for the glory of God. But Adam sinned, and his whole heart changed. And suddenly, instead of the world revolving around God, the world started to revolve around Adam. And he passed on that image, that likeness. We call it original sin. And it was passed on to his family. And folks, we are all a part of Adam's family. You could say it this way, we're kissing cousins. We all have the same grandfather. And every one of us live within our own self-centered reality. The world does not revolve around God. It revolves around us. And because of that, this led to the eventual destruction of the world. Look at Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And every imagination of the faults of his heart was only evil continually. What a condemnation. Every dream that man had was corrupt. It was selfish. It was for his own self. Folks, let me tell you something. There will be no change in your life spiritually until the images of your mind change from pleasing self to pleasing God. And that the passion of your life is to know Him and the fellowship with Him. For the Bible says that the rich man should not exalt himself in his riches. Or the wise man in his wisdom. But if we should glory, we should glory in the fact that we know and understand God. But before God destroyed the world, what was the imagination of man's heart like? It was corrupt. But the Bible also says that after the flood and all that was left was Noah's family, it did not change the corruption of their own imagination. For look at Genesis chapter 8 and verse 21. The Bible says, The Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. Before and after the flood, the imagination did not change. It is evil from youth. What does that mean? It means that every one of us, every one of us, were born with a corrupt imagination. Now, most of you probably don't remember your childhood at the age of two or three, but ask your parents. They probably remember they remember the corruption of your imagination because you used to try to do things that were really strange, like drink Drano out of the bottom of the uh, sink, underneath the sink. Or you did strange things with your food because you didn't stick it in your mouth. Or you, worked the, or you went into the nursery. Have you ever worked in a nursery? If you don't believe in original sin, work in a church nursery. With a long-winded preacher. And you'll find out very quickly that the two favorite words of children is, that's what? Mine. And so even from their youth, the reality of their life is centered on themselves. Now if this is the nature of man's imagination, how desperate do we need the right thought process? Let me say one other thing about the perversion of the imagination, and that is not only are we by nature selfish, but the imagination actually can become more corrupt over the process of time if we do not discipline our thought lives. The imagination is perverted by undisciplined sensual thoughts. One of the godliest men in the Old Testament was a fellow named Job. It's very interesting that Job said in his book, chapter 31 and verse 1, that he made an agreement, a covenant with his eyes. And in that covenant, he said that he would not think upon a maid. Let me put it in common terms. It means that he will not give careful attention to looking at a virgin. 
In other words, old men can still have dirty minds. And he said, I made an agreement that I would not look at young women and lust after them in, the, in his mind. That's exactly what he was saying. Why? Because he was a godly man. And he knew that he had to keep his imagination clean. What did Jesus say? If a man looks at a woman and lusts after he's committed adultery already in his heart. What does he mean? It's the imagination of immorality in the mind. And by the way, anybody that can capture the imagination is a powerful person. Today, Hollywood, television industry, has captured our minds through the television screen, through the movie theaters. And I'm not condemning the images in the sense that that in itself is wrong. There's nothing sinful about TV. There's nothing sinful about a DVD. The, the issue is not the media. It's the message. It's what's being communicated. And let me tell you something, folks. Corrupt hearts can not, not look at sensual things and think pure thoughts. And anyone who can capture the imagination of man's mind through pictures and images has a very powerful influence over society. And this is why every Christian should guard what he watches, what he looks at, what he allows his mind to see, because you will think what you watch. Have you ever watched a movie late at night? Turned off the lights and went to bed. And then all of a sudden you started having weird dreams about 4 o'clock in the morning and you started taking the movie in your life and it all got jumbled up. Have you ever had that happen to you? Or you wake up the next morning and the first thing you think about was the last thing you thought about before you went to bed. And all of a sudden the movie is being reproduced in your mind. What's the point? The point is that is the power of the imagination. The whole concept of pornography is essentially images of adultery placed in your mind. And this is why believers must guard their thought life. Because these images fuel your desires. And they will fuel your passions. And God wants our desires funneled towards Him and not towards self. And that leads me to the last thing this morning, and that is, then how do we... Guard, or how do we protect our imagination, especially concerning the fact that our hearts are naturally sinful? Let me begin, first of all, by saying that a part of the process of guarding your imagination, and it is a process, you will not do it overnight, is we have to start living in the presence of the fear of God. The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. What does it mean to fear God? Well, it's fair to say it means to tremble in His presence. But the fear of God is the awareness that God is watching and weighing the thoughts and the intents of your heart. It is God's perpetual knowledge of what you're thinking. There is nothing that you think that God doesn't know you're thinking. You can't hide your thoughts from God. Psalm 139, verse 1, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my down-sitting and my uprising. You understand my thoughts afar off. Solomon said in 1 Chronicles 28, and verse 9, David said to his son Scott, Solomon, excuse me, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of your father, and serve him with a perfect heart. And with a willing mind, for the Lord searches all hearts... And he understands all the imaginations of the thoughts. I travel a lot. And sometimes I'm often by myself. Whether it's on a plane, or in a motel room, or flying overseas to a foreign country. But folks, there's one thing I've never gotten away from, and that is no matter where I am, God really is watching do you live in the fear of God? There was a fellow in the Bible that did. 
You know who he was. His name was Joseph. When Joseph was 17 years old, his older brothers sold him into slavery. Nice big brothers. They sent him to the land of Egypt, and there he was bought by the commanding officer of Pharaoh's bodyguard. His name was Potiphar. The Bible tells us that Joseph had the blessing of God on his life, and Joseph was a, a very diligent man. And so, he became the steward or the manager of his household. We don't know a lot about Potiphar. My assumption is that he was rarely at home and paid very little attention to his wife. The Bible says her name was Potiphar's wife. I really don't know her first name, so we'll call her P.W. for short. I don't know her issues. I don't know what was going through her mind. The Bible doesn't tell us. We can't read into her thought life. All that we know is that one day P.W. showed up. We don't know. We can imagine in our mind what was going on. The Bible says that she simply tempted him with adultery. Now imagine, if you would, Joseph probably was in the neighborhood of 25, 26 years old, unmarried, and the prime vitality of his life. Joseph had the same flesh and blood every guy in this room has. And not only that, but Joseph had been demeaned by becoming a slave, and yet he had his own natural pride about himself. And so one day, this beautiful Egyptian woman shows up. I don't think, it, I don't think P.W. was ugly. I don't think that P.W. was, you know, you know, massively large. You know, she wasn't like Rhoda. You know what I'm saying? You know, the girl that's so big that when she puts on her yellow rain jacket, she looks like the local school bus coming down the road. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, I don't think it was her. She probably was very beautiful. And the Bible says she tempted him with adultery. And he said no. And why did he say no? What was it that was going on in his mind? It's an amazing thing to me to consider that he didn't have a Bible, he didn't have a church, he didn't have a pastor, he didn't have Christian friends around him. But the Bible tells us that he lived in the presence of God, for he said, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? How can I do this? Joseph lived with the continual awareness that God was watching his thoughts, that God was with him. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, and a heart that devises wicked imaginations. How is it that we overcome the struggles of our own heart and our images? It is recognizing that God is watching and weighing my thoughts. I live in the fear of God. Do you live that way? With your friends? With your conversation? with what you do in private. But in order to overcome these imaginations, it's just not enough to live in the fear of the Lord. Although that, obviously, I think was, is sufficient, but, but it has to take another step. And that is to understand something about the imagination. Because it's very interesting that in the Old Testament, the imagination is put side by side with stubbornness and idolatry. We are all stubborn about what we want. Have you ever gotten irritated with a roommate because there was something that you wanted in the room that you didn't get? We are all stubborn about the things that we desire, and our imagination fuels our desires, and we become stubborn, or we hold on to these things. And the Bible speaks of the reality that we have to be broken in our imagination. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 24, But they hearken not, nor incline their ear, but walk in the counsels and the imagination of their evil heart, and they went backwards and not forward. This is speaking of the nation of Israel. They began to worship an idol. What is an idol? It's creating God in my image. Idolatry says to me, God is. To me, God is. That is idolatry because it is not what you think about God. It's what God has revealed about Himself in His Word. God is. I am. And therefore we accept who He is. 
And so imagination and idolatry run hand in hand. And in order for there to be a change in the heart, there has to be a brokenness. This evil people, Jeremiah said, which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart, and they walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them, shall even be as this girdle which is good for nothing. And so somewhere along the line, there has to be a brokenness over my desires and my dreams and what I imagine I want out of life, and I must come and surrender them to the Lordship of Christ. When I got saved at the age of 19 years old, it was a dramatic turnaround in my life. And I think that one of the things that God continually worked in my life was my breaking, really breaking me over my own self-will, what I wanted out of life. We all have dreams and imagination of what our life is to be like, and what God wants us to do is to submit all of our dreams and imaginations to Him. Where everything is brought under His authority and His power. Have you ever stopped to consider that when the world turned against God, it says they glorified Him not as God, neither were they thankful, but they became vain in their imaginations. They began to live for themselves. They walked after their own counsels and after their own heart's lusts. And so idolatry and the imagination and stubbornness all go together. And in the Old Testament, what do they do with the idols? They broke them. What did God call them to do? To humble themselves. To turn away from their stubbornness and their own imagination and bring every imagination into the captivity of obedience to Christ for you to cast down these imaginations. There was a book written by a Puritan named Stephen Sharnock. It's entitled, The Existence and the Attributes of God. He made an interesting statement. He said, all sin is found in secret atheism. All the wicked inclinations of the heart are sparks from this fire. The language of every one of these is, I would be Lord to myself and would not have God superior to me. A man in every sin aims to set up his own will as his rule and his own glory as the end of his actions against the will and the glory of God. What motivates us? Is it our dreams of our self-centered reality? Or have we been broken over ourselves and surrendered our imagination so that my life is to bring glory and honor to God? That's the bottom line. And there has to be a brokenness over that. Are you willing to be broken? Are you willing to be broken over, for example, sexual desires and bring them into submission to Christ? Are you willing to take your future, your imagination of what your life is to be like, and take it all and scrap it and simply bow to Christ and say, Lord, what would you have me to do? That's all that I want to do. Because until the imagination is in surrender to the Lordship of Christ, then basically we're playing games with God. And that leads me to the last thing, and that is we have to develop a godly imagination. How do we do that? Would you take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 26 because there's a very interesting statement here that the Scripture gives us. And, and of course, there are many verses that you could turn to to, to, uh, to uh, validate my statement. But Isaiah 26.3 says, many of you know this, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts or he relies in God. Now think with me. Thou will keep him in perfect peace. In the Hebrew language, the word peace is the word, what is it? Does anybody know it? Shalom. But when this verse was written by the Spirit of God, and he wrote, Thou will keep him in perfect shalom, the word perfect here is also the word shalom. So it's said this way. Thou will keep him in shalom, shalom. Now, why did God say it twice? Well, you and I understand this. When we sit down to write a letter and we're on the Internet and we're writing an email and we want to emphasize a statement or word, what do we put it in? We put it in what? 
Put it in bold. That way, we want you to get this. We want you to understand it. Now, in biblical times, of course, they didn't have that opportunity to do it that way, so they said it twice. It's a point of emphasis. Jesus said, barely, barely. said it twice. Why? Point of emphasis. That will keep him in shalom, shalom. You want to live in peace? Here's the way. You want to have perfect peace? You want to have a sense of the absence of conflict and the presence of contentment? You want to have a sense of a commitment to people and a love for people? Here's how. That will keep in the perfect peace whose mind, and that word mind is imagination, whose imagination is stayed on me. In other words, the pathway to this life of peace and blessing is through the development of an imagination that keeps its thoughts on the Lord. Now, how do you do that? And folks, I, I don't know how to say it any other way. But you are going to have to make a commitment to set your mind, your thoughts, on the only thing that God has really given us that is a perfect way for our imagination to be clean and pure. The only way we can do that is setting our mind on this book. What does that involve? It means reading it. The greatest habit I ever established in my life was when I was 20 years old, my sophomore year of college in a state school, I started getting up every morning and reading this book. I've tried by the grace of God to keep that practice now for 28 years. So that this morning I got up and I'm reading from Second Chronicles because I read through the Bible every year. And every morning I read three chapters of the Bible with pen and paper in hand and I simply read it slowly, carefully because I'm not doing it as a duty. I am doing it so that my mind can be renewed. So when I read Scripture, I look for the character of God. When I read Scripture, I look for God's promises for me today. When I read Scripture, I look at the nature of man and the way that he responds to God, either in belief or unbelief. For the Bible gives us individuals who are set before us as both positive and negative examples. And I read the Scripture so that my mind can be daily renewed. You read the Bible, then secondly, it is not enough to read it, but you need to memorize it. The Bible tells us if we hide the Word in our heart, we will not sin against God, because where do we sin? It starts in the imagination. So when I'm memorizing Scripture, I am taking the time. Have you ever noticed how hard it is to memorize Scripture? How many of you ever try to memorize Scripture and you have a hard time remembering the verses? Or you... Almost fall asleep memorizing. Why? Why can we do that? And why, and, and why is it that we can turn on the TV set and watch a dumb commercial that has to do with beer and read it the very, and remember it the very first time? Why is that? Does it not reveal our own natural corruption? But as we discipline our minds to memorize the Scripture, and then we start to meditate on it, we chew it over, we think it over, what happens in the process of time, our, our imagination starts thinking about God so that our mind does not instantly go to sin, our mind instantly starts going to the Son. And we start thinking about the words of truth because as we hide the word in our heart, what happens? We learn not to sin against God. The development of the imagination comes through the process of Bible reading and memory and meditation. And if we do not develop this discipline when we are young, then what is going to happen when we get older and we get out and we get into the world and we get busy with our life and our families and our marriages and all of a sudden our minds are still centered on self? If I meet a young person who is still essentially the same after two or three years in a college or whatever, and their life's not been changed, it's because the imagination hasn't been changed. And may God help us today to keep our thoughts and our minds on Him so that we will be pure and so that we will be clean and so that we will glorify God. Would you bow your head with me, please, and let's all stand to our feet.
As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, I'm going to ask you to be honest. I asked yesterday morning how many of you would be honest if God speaks to your heart, you'll do what He says. And almost the vast percentage of you raised your hand. Now, please be honest this morning. Number one, how many of you would acknowledge very simply today, Steve, I do struggle in the realm of my imagination. I'm not just speaking sensually. But really, it's more selfishly. So that I have conflicts with people. I have a problem with pride. I have a struggle with sensual thoughts. Sometimes I'm not motivated to live for the Lord. I mean, I could go on and on, but I'm just going to ask you to be honest. How many of you would admit this morning the struggle with your own imagination? Would you be willing to be honest to be admit that today? Would you lift your hands where you're right standing today? Preacher, I will admit it today. God bless you. May put your hands down. Now, here's where I want to get to the nitty gritty. How many of you would say, Preacher, I must admit that when it comes to reading and meditating on Scripture and hiding God's Word in my heart that I might not sin against God, I have to admit that at the very best, I'm inconsistent. You show me people that struggle with depression, people that struggle with disobedience, with carnal thoughts, stubborn thoughts. It's got to go back to your relationship with God, folks. It's got to. How many of you will acknowledge this morning, preacher, I do struggle with the disciplined habit of daily meditating, memorizing, and studying the Scripture. And I'll just be honest, because that does connect us back to the imagination. Who would be honest about that this morning? Would you lift your hand, slip it up? Preacher, I will be honest about that. Raise your hand. Come on, be honest. God knows what we're thinking. God knows where we're living. Honesty is the first step to change. Thank you. You may put your hands down. Now, my question I want to propose to you this morning is, are you willing to be broken before God in humble submission? Where you take your thoughts and you say, God, I want to think your thoughts. And I want my ways to be your ways. God, forgive me of pride and forgive me of stubbornness and forgive me of selfishness and forgive me of arrogance. Forgive me of sensuality. Forgive me of, of, of actually covetousness because covetous means that this is what I want to get out of my life and this is what I want my life to be like instead of really surrendering to the Lordship of Christ. Are you willing this morning to be broken? Are you willing to take the idols of your imagination as they did in the Old Testament and they took them out and they ground them to powder? Are you willing to take those things and place them in God's hands and start today? And it is a process, it's a lifelong process of developing the imagination on the things of the Lord. In a moment I'm going to ask our instrumentalist to play a very simple hymn, Search Me, O God. A lot of plays this morning where we have a simple invitation. And I'm going to ask those of you that God has spoken to your heart, and you know you need to make a decision. You need to. Then I'm going to ask, as the invitation is played, that you can either do one of three things. Either you can come forward and kneel here at the front. You can go back in the back, behind the chairs, and get on your knees back there. Or you can simply drop to your knees where you're standing. And take this time to confess, to acknowledge, to surrender, and to commit yourself to obedience to God. If you want blessing, there has to be obedience. Father, bless the invitation. Forgive us of our sins, where we so often in our imagination are corrupt. And help us, Lord, to think the thoughts that you have given us in your word. God, may you work at this time in people's hearts. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, the invitation will not be long. But it will be long enough for you to acknowledge in a humble manner before God 
the desire of your heart and the desire to change as the instrument plays, would you obey God right now?